Thanks, Howard. Good evening, folks. Good to see you. And nice to see one or two people from Fusion. I think the rest of them are all up at Big Church Day Out. So uh, you guys are in here tonight, which is great. It's nice to have you with us. Well, as Howard said, uh, my name is Rich. I'm the pastor here, and it is a privilege to add my welcome now to uh, the one of Howard's. And uh, it'd be really helpful tonight if you had your Bibles open in front of you and turned to uh, Psalm 16 that we just had read. Now, many of the characters in the Bible, the, the people who we read about in the scriptures, they live their lives under the constant and terrible threat of, it seems, tyrannical rulers. And at times, some of those rulers seemed almost demonically bent on destruction, destruction of the people of God, destruction of life and world just for the sake of it. All of the characters of Scripture, and all of us this evening, we too, whether we face persecution or not, we too live under a weighty cloud. We all live beneath the lightless shroud of death. The psalmist King David was a man whose life was under constant threat and there were times where it looked like he was living his last day. So how does a person cope with that? How can we cope with death hanging over us? Every day we're bombarded with the cruel reality of the presence of death in our world, whether it's the sad passing of another church member into glory or the death of a favorite pet or perhaps out there in the world in in our culture there's a musician or a celebrity or a writer or or, or a a well-known person who has left the land of the living of course just this week we remembered the many who were killed in the manchester arena bombing this is a cruel cruel reality in our world isn't it death is something that we cannot escape the poison the pinch the power of in our world so what hope is there for our dying world what hope is there for us against the tyranny of death and its constant clawing at our peace and comfort Some people will, of course, attempt to distract themselves with all kinds of distractions from the reality and the imminence of their own death. Their own mortality is something we're all, I guess, in one way or another, trying to cover up, whether it's fitness, health, makeup, clothing, whether it is just the distraction of games, films, books, gardens, whatever it is, we choose to divert our attention away from this thing that is constantly at work within us. Sooner or later, those efforts will be futile as we face the reality of our own death. Or as somebody close to us, someone we deeply love and care for, is lying on their deathbed. Perhaps that's you even this evening. You're facing up to the stark reality and pain of death and memory. What can so disarm the fear and power of death that we can live in peace what could possibly comfort us against that reality death it seems is such an unanswerable truth we want something to answer it don't we we want there to be a reality that is bigger that is stronger more powerful than this tyranny that we live under we want something to answer it to silence it to pour scorn upon it that we could live a life of hope and peace in this world we long for it in here don't we we wonder if that is a real thing a real possibility and let me tell you here in psalm 16 we will see that yes there is such an answer to death Can you imagine it? Just imagine the inevitable, remorseless, relentless fear of death which hounds and threatens us and dominates our world, sucking life and hope and joy from us all. Silenced, diminished, eclipsed, gone. 
glory. What a reality. And there is. There is a truth whose sound, whose music rings out into this world of tears that we live in. It is a song that plays with such power and melody that it evokes joy even in such days. It utterly drowns out the dreary noise of death's song and brings its bright reality to warm our hearts. There is an answer. There is a source of joy and of life. There is a death-crushing reality held out to us in God's word tonight. Now, Psalm 16, it takes David far above all human wisdom to the one great fact, the singular event which did enable David to face his own death with faith and hope. Now, at first sight, the psalm maybe seems fairly straightforward as we, as we read it. It, it. it seems maybe it's nothing more than David's own testimony, his own trust and confidence in the Lord. It's his Spiritual confession, if you like, of the Lord's care for him. But have a look at verses 9 through to 11. Verses 9 to 11 says this, Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Were those words ever true of King David? Did these things ever actually happen to him? How could he speak like this if this never actually happened to him? Well, the great apostle Peter tells us exactly how and why David speaks like this in this psalm in his great sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You might want to turn to Acts chapter 2 and follow with me. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy section there from verse 24. Acts chapter 2 from verse 24. Speaking of Jesus, God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter, in his preaching, says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would not set that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So verse 25, Peter says, David says concerning him, Christ. In verse 31, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he, the Christ, was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Peter could hardly be clearer, I think. When David wrote Psalm 16, he wasn't thinking of his own death at all. He was actually prophetically articulating the faith and hope of Jesus Christ as he faced his death on the cross a thousand years after David had died. 
I love the way that Peter underlines his point there in verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. David was definitely not speaking about himself in this psalm. David died and decayed. The psalm cannot be about him. This is so exciting for us, Psalm 16, so exciting, because it shows us that the Old Testament saints had their faith and hope fixed on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, just as we do today. And this makes sense for us of how the Old Testament believers will be saved. They aren't going to be in heaven because in their day there was a different set of rules about how they could be saved. They aren't rewarded with salvation because of genetics or obedience to the law or whatever works, good works. They aren't saved because of a vague understanding of a few vague ideas about a coming rescuer. Unclear concepts about sacrifice and substitute, which are then later deemed to be faith in Christ. Implicit faith. No. That would be, I think, to diminish the person and work of Jesus Christ. If there was another way to be saved. But there isn't. The scriptures are clear. There is only one name under heaven by which we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And also, I think that problem with that is it takes a low view of the spirit of prophecy that we see here. And this is the point that Peter makes, actually, again, another point that he makes in his first letter. In 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, he says, concerning this salvation that he's been speaking about, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. The Spirit of Christ was in those Old Testament writers predicting the sufferings and glory of Christ, the death and resurrection. Those Old Testament saints did search diligently as to when the cross and resurrection would happen. The exact time wasn't precisely revealed, but they longed for it to happen nonetheless. Their faith was in the resurrection and death of Jesus Christ. Their hope in the face of their own deaths was that God has a resurrection plan through his son for the world. So with this confidence, let's go back to Psalm 16 now and see how it is that Christ faced his own death. And, well, that'll help us all as we think about death and how we face it as well. So, in Psalm 16, we know now from Acts 2 that the me and the I of Psalm 16 is actually Christ, not David. The spirit of Christ within David actually gave David this prophetic ability, which is just like, wow, to give, the ex- give expression to the faith and hope of Jesus Christ as he faced his own death on the cross. It's like, what an amazing comfort it must have been to Jesus as he was growing up to be able to read this psalm and and know some of his own thoughts written a thousand years before he was born. He was able to learn about how he could face the terrible suffering and abandonment of the cross. So the psalm begins with his absolute faith in his father. Now, strictly speaking, of course, in Scripture, the object of faith is always the Son. But here, as we see Christ's faith in his Father, it shows us how we are to trust in Christ himself. Isaiah 53, verse 3, describes Jesus as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, yet not for a moment does he doubt the will of his Father for him. That Simple faith in in his father's care is the foundation for Christ's assurance as he faces the cross. And verse 2 takes the faith of Jesus just a step deeper. In his earthly ministry later, Christ Jesus often acknowledged that everything he had came from the father. He only does his work. He only does his will. 
So in John 8, 28, for example, he says, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Jesus freely confesses that he, all he says and does, it comes straight from the Father. That which I see my Father doing, this I do before you. Christ's utter dependence on his Father and the power of the Spirit is such a lesson for us. That if, if the eternal Christ, the very craftsman of the universe, knew the need for such absolute dependence on his Father and the Spirit, then how much more do we? How much more do we need to deny ourselves, our own self-reliance, and look instead to the triune God? Verse 3 of Psalm 16 is a, is a great encouragement to me and to us, I, I'm sure, that Christ sees the saints here as the excellent ones. Isn't that a lovely phrase to describe the church, the believers, the excellent ones? He is delighted in us. It seems hard to believe, doesn't it, when we examine ourselves and our lives. But, but when he looks at the church, he, he, he knows he has paid. That's what the whole thing was about, the cross. Their sins are covered over the righteousness of God is now theirs. And he sees us as excellent, beautiful, pure, something to be desired, something that he would long for, the excellent ones. It's wonderful, isn't it? If this love for the church, for those who trust in him, that's the thing that sustained Christ as he faced the cross as we read elsewhere in Scripture, and we'll see that shortly. So remember what he says, uh, for example, at the Last Supper. The Last Supper, just hours before his death, Jesus says in Luke 22, When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Earnest desire. It was a great comfort uh, to Jesus to be with these saints in heaven when he went to his death, his own death, to have his friends around him as he faces death. And in my experience too, to have our friends around us when, when somebody is dying, to have Christian fellowship at the bedside of the dying, it's so important. As we read scripture, as we maybe sing a hymn, as we share testimonies and, and we point to the hope, the resurrection, it refreshes their confidence, the dying, in who Jesus is and what he has done for them. But in verses 4 and 5 here in Psalm 16, we see that he would never share the, the false hopes and the pointless rituals of those who don't trust the word of God. So in terms of human religions and the way the world faces death, there's no comfort there in these man-made realities. Whatever God it is. So often when, we, when I speak or we speak to people who, who talk about their religion or, or their understanding of, of what's going to happen after they die, even the most devout religious folk the best they can say is, well, I hope I'll be okay, but I don't know for sure. No, Christ was confident, confident in the will of his Father. So he accepted the cup that was assigned to him, verse 5, even though it was not an easy cup. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, Jesus felt so overwhelmed with sorrow at those last hours before his arrest. And we'd think maybe surely that's the time. That is the time, the cracking point, when under such great pressure he would not accept the cup that was given to him. But no, Psalm 16 predicts that Christ would trust himself to what the Father had planned for him. So in Matthew 26, verse 42, he says, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. 
how was Jesus able to bear such a cup? How could he bear to face such terrible suffering, such a bleak and uniquely lonely death? Verse 6 tells us, He kept his heart and mind fixed on his inheritance. He knew what the outcome of his suffering would be. He knew what it was for. He knew that it would not be forever, but it would lead to something so great that it would completely outweigh even that terrible suffering of the cross. So Hebrews 12 verse 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross because he kept thinking about the glorious ones, his inheritance, the resurrection joy that was set before him. And this is why we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. The Father's will for you and for me may at times seem completely perplexing and overwhelming, more than we can bear even. But he has set such an amazing reality before us nevertheless. Remember the words that the Apostle Paul spoke in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And Paul didn't say those words lightly. Paul suffered so much. He knew a great deal about the long and painful, unrelenting suffering of this world and and, and persecution and, and the white hot anger of rage of people. We heard quite a bit about that this morning from Pastor Steve. Just as Christ himself also knew of great and terrible suffering, verses 5 and 6, he knew the same. So he could drink the cup assigned to him because he knew that he had a delightful inheritance, a delightful inheritance, all drawn up, all set out, planned and and paid for now. In verses 7 and 8, We're shown here about the constant, intimate relationship that Christ enjoyed with his Father. At night, he could think of him and and keep him in mind at all times. Like when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he could pray, he could talk to his Father. He honoured his Father, and therefore he knew he would never be shaken. No matter how troubled he was about the cross, and make no mistake, he was deeply troubled sweating great drops of blood at the thought of it. But he knew nevertheless that he was safe in his father's will. Therefore, therefore, verses 9 to 11, because of this heart and mind, because of this faith, because of this obedience, because of this deep trust in his father's will, Christ's heart was glad and he was able to sing praises. Yeah, even praises rejoicing gladness even with that terrible death hanging over him and he knew that the cross would not last forever verse 9 his body would rest secure because he would not be abandoned to the grave jesus's own resurrection is given such profound expression here isn't it by the prophet david He could bear for his body to undergo and endure such a cruel, vicious death because he knew that his body would be resurrected, utterly renewed, clothed with immortality. And we can share that same hope and confidence of Christ, the hope of verse 9, because his death and resurrection, we can trust in him and know for sure that our bodies will also not be abandoned to the grave forever sure our bodies will decay away just like king david's but that's not the last we'll see of them we will get our bodies back 
Which is why for many Christians, they see burial as a better witness than cremation. Our bodies matter. Everyone who trusts in Christ looks forward to getting a new and improved body. They get their bodies back from the grave. So for the Christian, uniquely we can say that our bodies rest in peace. But we see that the fantastic, amazing, wonderful resurrection hope of Christ there in verse 10, it's more specifically unique to him. These are things that we cannot say. Nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. You see, Jesus knew that going to the cross on Friday, that Sunday was coming. He knew that he would be risen again on the third day according to the scriptures. He'd said it again and again. His body would never have the chance to see decay. The resurrection would happen so quickly. His body regenerated, clothed in that immortal flesh. Life in the new creation as the firstborn from the dead. There he stands, the stone rolled away on the third. It's exactly what happened. Psalm 16 is utterly vindicated by the events of Easter morning. The ancient prophetic song of King David, it came true, just as, just as it would be, just as we should expect when God speaks. The stone was rolled away and Jesus emerged victorious from the grave. And this is the great lesson for us from Psalm 16. The Old Testament saints look forward to the cross and resurrection of Christ. The spirit of Christ in them was, was prophesying, revealing, working on them. And he also used the pictures and the, the actions of the priests and the sacrifices and the kings and the great theater of the tabernacle, the patterns, the types, but also these prophetic words so that they could look forward to these amazing events taking place in history. The Holy Spirit didn't give David these words, this amazing revelation, simply for his own private enjoyment or help. That's why they're in the church's songbook, the Psalms. It's for the, for, it's for the saints to sing so that we may all enjoy and be nourished by this resurrection, life and light and reality. Down through the ages, singing songs about the resurrection have sent the church out into their week ahead with a strong march that we can walk with upright heads and face all kinds of trials and troubles. Whether it was the Old Testament saints singing Psalm 16, they knew that they didn't need to fear the grave because the Holy One would not be abandoned. The Holy One would not see corruption. His body would be resurrected. We look back where they looked forward. But the same truth is what saves us, both old and new. The same faith, the same hope, the same confidence, the same Lord. Paul says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is the hope of the ages. It is the living hope that we can hold out before a dying world. It is the light that guides us through the darkness, the times of grief and sadness. It's the burning hope that sustains us, that drags us through daily pain. It is the song that brings joy when all around is misery. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we are to be pitied above all people. Our faith is empty, futile, and dead. It's the heartbeat. It's the centerpiece. It's the heart of all the proclamation in the scriptures of the apostles. The resurrection of Jesus is the world-changing reality that took martyrs through the flames. It's the truth that outweighs even that oppressive weight and burden of death. It silences it forever. O oh, grave, how grave is your defeat. Amen. <laughs>